As the COVID-19 pandemic is rapidly evolving, the circumstances may have changed from the time this podcast was recorded and may not reflect the current environment. Hi, and welcome to The Chip, the Canadian Health Information Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Mahu. This show from the Canadian Institute for Health Information will give you an in-depth look at Canada's health systems and talk to experts you can trust. If you're interested in health policy or healthcare systems, and the work being done to keep Canadians healthy, this podcast is for you. Today on our season finale, we're joined by a very special guest, Dr. Vivek Goel, a renowned physician and a public health researcher who is also the chair of Kai High's board of directors. Dr. Goel is a professor in the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. On July 1st of this year, he became the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Waterloo. He's made tremendous contributions to advance the health of Canadians. He is a member of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, the Chair of the Expert Advisory Group on the Development of a Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, and he's a Scientific Advisor for CanCOVID, the National Research Platform for COVID-19 Research. If that wasn't enough, he is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and a member of the Order of Canada. Dr. Goel is here to chat with us about what life post-COVID will look like for Canadians and what we can expect our new normal to be like. Let's get to it. Hi, Vivek. Welcome to The Chip. How are you doing? Great. How are you, Alex? I'm good, thanks. It's been a long, challenging pandemic year. There have been many changes in how we live our lives. What are some things that have surprised you? Well, there's so many things uh, that have surprised, I think, everyone. You know, I think probably the the most impressive thing is to see how resilient people actually have been, right? It's been 16, 70, whatever the right number is now, <laughs> long, long months. And, uh, you know, I think back in the beginning of March 2020, 20, I don't think any of us would have imagined we would spend more than a year working from home, be able to do the kinds of things that we're doing online, you know, at the university, we've delivered entire programs virtually, Mm -hmm. Um, people have moved their shopping, people have been doing their exercise classes over Zoom. (laughs) So, and it's amazing to see how fast people actually did adapt to all of that. It's not been easy. And there have been lots of challenges and lots of impact on people's mental health. And so we have to be cognizant of that. But for me, that is certainly a major lesson, just how adaptable humans can actually be when the pressure is on. Mm -hmm. People have certainly been resilient. There have certainly been a lot of learnings in the past year and a half. From your perspective, what have been the most important lessons we've learned about Canada's health systems? So we've obviously learned a lot about the ongoing challenges that we have in many parts of the healthcare system and two very important areas that uh, Kai has done very significant work, long-term care and more generally, how we support older adults, right? How we treat them, how we regard them. This was an issue for, for decades, right? And so it's not anything new, but the pandemic really opened it up for everyone. I think in the early days, we certainly saw the impact on on long-term care. And unfortunately, in many parts of the country, we saw it again in the second wave, even though there was Mm -hmm. clarity on what needed to be done. And the second big area is around the important contribution of the social determinants of health. And again, with the pandemic, there were people, I think, very early on who started to talk about the communities that were being impacted and so on. But it took a little bit of while and took the data being generated to really demonstrate the impact of housing, occupation, ethnicity, and the intersection of those factors into the people that were least protected, mm-hmm. were not able to safely work from home. And so we have seen the impact that has on health and on our healthcare system. We also saw the impact that the public health measures, the restrictions also had on many of the same populations. 
And you know, with all of these things, we've also seen the importance of really good, timely data to inform decision making. Mm -hmm. Well, you're leading me to my next question, which is one of the things I think COVID has highlighted is the importance and the power of data. And in a time where information is constantly evolving and changing and being updated, there's an obvious need for timely data that people can trust. What has the pandemic taught us about Canada's health analytics and data tracking? So we clearly have some great systems in place for tracking health data, but we also know we have challenges, right? In particular, we have challenges in the timeliness of the data that we have, and we have challenges in the coverage across the country. Mm -hmm. and, and with COVID, very early on, it became clear that at a national level, we did not have timely, complete data on COVID cases. And if we wanted to drill into things like symptom history or place of an outbreak, the employment of someone who's infected, that data had been and continues to be across the country challenging to have. There's challenges with collecting that data to begin with, right? You have to go and talk with people to find out what their occupation is. And if public health is being overwhelmed, there's challenges, but there's challenges with how it gets coded whether it gets coded consistently across the jurisdictions or even across different health units or health departments. And then there's challenges with getting it transmitted. So uh, while you know, we have some good information, uh, we were able to have, for example, some pretty good reporting on mortality in long-term care. I think Kai Hai's report on that came out in June of 2020, last, right? And so, as I said earlier, we had some good information about that that may not have been acted on as we got to the second wave. But we also have challenges in a lot of other areas in terms of being able to have timely data. Mm -hmm, absolutely. We know that data can help inform decision makers. You know this more than anyone. You, you are the chair of the expert advisory group on the development of a pan-Canadian health data strategy. Why does a comprehensive data strategy matter for Canadians? So, if we want to ensure that we're giving Canadians, first of all, at an individual level, the best possible health care that they could get, and also ensuring that we're protecting public health, promoting population health, and, and then enabling the kind of research, the development of new technologies and, and processes that they deserve, we need to harness the power of data. And we need to make it easier for them, first of all, to get their own data. Right now, I don't think there's anyone in Canada who can get access to their own health information in a timely way. And if they can get access to it, it involves logging into multiple different portals, right? Lab tests over here, diagnostic imaging over there, their medical records over here. And there may be a few jurisdictions, a, a few places where it's, it's getting better, but it's far from ideal. If you're a provider and you have a patient in front of you and you want to know what their imaging results from a year ago, it's not necessarily easy to get that, right? So we know we're not delivering services. We're not supporting providers in an efficient way in giving the best possible service to get. So that's the first level, right? I'd start with what Canadians need. And then we can think about our First Nations, Inuit, Métis communities. They don't have the information they need and, and they're increasingly responsible and want to be in charge of their own services. They should be able to manage and follow their own approaches other communities, as I mentioned earlier, the ones that were most affected, whether it's Black community, immigrant communities, uh, what we call the hotspots, they don't have timely data. And then if you think of it from a policy perspective, from a health administration management perspective, do we have timely data in each of those settings? So in, in this work that our expert group is doing, we're going through each of these different communities and looking at what are the challenges that they have. And, and unfortunately, the limitations 
that they have in access to data are not new, right? In our first report released on June 17th, you know, we actually start with quotes from the inquiry into SARS chaired by Dr. David Naylor. And I have a quote from the 1991 Wilk Commission report. For listeners to the podcast, go look up the report from the expert group, read the quote from the Wilk Commission. And if you didn't know it was written in 91, you'd be thinking it's describing what we're seeing right now with health information in Canada. And so that's the sad part, right? So we sort of turned all of these things up and they're in the public eye during COVID. But these challenges for the flows of information, the root causes have been around for a long time. So in our first report, we described those root causes and we really are looking at how we can overcome those root causes. And the challenges are not about simply building better systems, using better technology and and methods. We certainly have to do that. But the challenges are around engaging the public and engaging providers and ensuring they understand why the flows of data are important, how they benefit from the sharing of data, how providers can benefit that, you know, when you're seeing a patient, if you want to have timely access to the past procedures, we need the flow of information to happen. We need to look at our policies and our privacy frameworks. Most importantly, we need to modernize that for the digital age because the models that we have are based essentially on paper records. So even a concept like health information custodian is the custodian of the paper records. When you have to go to the basement of the hospital or go to the medical records room, there was a custodian of the record. But what does that mean in a digital age where you don't have to have a paper record? But you know, even in with digital technologies, again, as many of our listeners will be familiar with, digitization actually still involves the digital movement of images of what are essentially paper records, PDF forms. And you know, during COVID, we had stories of faxes still moving around. Another component is accountable alliances because there are many different players in the health system, federal government, provinces, territories, but then we have providers, we have the health system organizations, and we have individuals out there. And everyone has to hold each other to account And then the final component that we've identified is interoperability, right? Common definitions. And it does not mean single big box systems, right? With modern technologies, we can have interoperable systems, but everyone has their own system. And so that's our first report. We're going to continue to work over the summer and drill into each of these areas. And our second report will try and lay out a path forward to overcome these root causes that we know have been with us for many, many decades. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And that is just one of your roles. Uh, Vivek, you wear a lot of hats. You're a public health researcher, health services evaluation expert, Kai High's board chair, a professor. I would imagine that having this many roles in and of itself is a huge challenge and would be accompanied by a lot of pressure and stress. Have you found that some of these roles have been more challenging than others during the pandemic? So, you know, certainly in the early part of the pandemic, part of my role at the University of Toronto was helping to lead the university's own response. And, you know, if you think of University of Toronto is a community of about 100,000 people operating across multiple campuses. Mm-hmm. We have residences, food services, we have daycare. It's like we're right. a little town, right? We're a large town, if you can think <laughs> about it. So we had to deal with everything. So that was certainly a very stressful period, as it was for many, many people. And uh, we were faced with a lot of uncertainty, rapidly evolving information. And, you know, juggling things was obviously challenging. But in terms of, you know, the multiple roles you highlighted, like, you know, one thing, and you, as you can hear from my answer to the earlier questions is that I've always been involved in working with data. Well, I think I can confidently say on behalf of Kai High, we're very grateful for that. 
I want to pivot a little bit and look ahead through the final waves of the pandemic. I know we're all wondering when life will start to feel normal again. Can you walk us through what you think we can maybe expect? You know, I wish I had a, a crystal ball uh, that would <laughs> let me tell you exactly what to expect. Uh, you know, I think there's still a significant amount of uncertainty, although, you know, we're in a much, much better place than we were even a few months ago or a month ago. So in the next few months, I think we're in for a pretty good summer in most parts of the country. The vaccination program is, is really picked up steam. We're leading the world in doses per day. Probably sometime in early July, we will pass the United States in the proportion of population that has had first and second doses. So back in March, April, like I don't think anyone would have imagined that would be possible. And, and probably by the end of summer, we will be leading pretty well every major OECD country. Um, you know, there's a few really small island countries that got, they had 100,000 people to do and they got them all done early on. And so <laughs> the list of countries will be down there. But if you think of major economies in the world, countries with more than a million population will be up there. And, you know, right now across most of the country, the case counts are trending downwards. And so there are some variants that we have to keep an eye on, but, you know, I think we'll have things manageable. Now, the big risk is what kind of potential fall wave comes about. Uh, you know, people now for most parts of Canada would refer to it as a potential fourth wave. And I think the thing that uh, I would say is we have to understand there is going to be a fourth wave of disease. Mm -hmm. The question is when it comes and how big it is. Is it going to be something that's going to be manageable, not right. uh, cause a surge on health system capacity. We have to acknowledge that this is not going away anytime soon. And there will be places in the world that are gonna have COVID uh, because the vaccination program is not rolling out uh, evenly around the world. Canada is gonna be mm -hmm. leading the world, but there's gonna be many parts in the world that will have not have the vaccine. So that has implications for us in terms of our ability to travel, to have family members who might be living abroad visit us. I think we will start to have travel, but there may, will probably be requirements for testing. We'll see the lifting of vaccine uh, of um, quarantine requirements for vaccinated travelers, and that will happen slowly. So we're not going back to exactly the way we were. I think it'll be a new normal. You know, I think we're going to have sporadic outbreaks. But as long as we can detect them quickly, so that means having regular surveillance testing, we have the public health capacity to do contact tracing and support people in isolation, we'll be able to manage those sporadic outbreaks that will uh, come up across the country. So, you know, the bottom line is I don't see anytime soon that it'll be completely back to normal. But I think in most parts of society, we will start to be able to go about our business. And it may take a little bit longer in some of the provinces and territories across the country, but we will see the lifting of social distancing requirements, the lifting of mass requirements start to happen. Mm -hmm. You've already spoken to a few of these, but I'm hoping to get to your quick rapid fire thoughts on a few specific elements of society and how you might envision those changing post COVID. Let's start with large event gatherings like sports and concerts. It's going to vary over the coming months. So certainly in the next few months, because it's going to be done separately for every province territory. You know, we've seen now in several uh, provinces when we had more teams in the NHL playoffs, <laughs> <laughs> they were starting to allow vaccinated healthcare workers with masks in small numbers, you know, 10% capacity or so for the events. And I think we'll continue to see that gradually ramp up. At some point, I would say, as we have a critical portion of the population fully vaccinated, disease transmission rates are right down. I think we will start to see events starting to get back pretty close to the way they were. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that'll be fantastic news for a lot of people listening. Masks, will these become a more permanent part of how we live our lives, even past COVID? 
you know, I think that's going to be an interesting question, probably more for sociologists to start to explore what the cultural practices will be. You know, masks were a cultural practice in many parts of the world, in Asia. And, you know, we saw how that they were able to better deal with the first wave because of some of those attitudes. And, you know, they have other attitudes towards hygiene. So, you know, whether we will accept that and stick with some of those practices on a voluntary basis or not, I think that's going to be a sociological question. Like, again, if you look in in the United States, people are ripping off their masks and (laughs) saying, we're not going back. Canadians have been sort of in between on that. My own prediction is there will probably be some types of settings where some people will want to continue to wear masks. My last rapid fire keyword for you, vaccinations. How do they play a role in managing post-COVID life? Yeah, so right now the immediate thing is just getting to vaccinate enough vaccinations. <laughs> I'm jumping the gun here. Post-COVID and getting it around the world. The data is still emerging around whether boosters are going to be required. And so there's two sort of paths to whether we will need boosters. One is if the immunity induced by vaccination starts to wane over time. And the second way in which we may need a need, have a need for further vaccinations is if the variants continue to evolve and we have a variant that the existing vaccines are not providing protection for. So far, all the major variants, there is a a good degree of protection from the vaccines. So those are going to be complex issues. And again, that goes back to, it's not going away. The risk will be with us and we're going to be living with it in a new normal sort of way. Mm -hmm. That's great insight. Many Canadians have expressed feelings of stress, anxiety about returning to a new normal, what it will look like, how to make that transition and the social expectations that undoubtedly that will take place along along with that. Do you have any advice for how to manage those concerns? You know, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge the concerns. You know, it really is about having dialogues with people understanding why they might have concerns. Maybe they have a family member that's immunocompromised. Maybe they had a family member that got COVID and they had to follow their hospitalization, maybe their death. People will have different reasons how COVID has affected them and have different expectations about what might happen to them as they get back out into society. And so there's not a single message to give, right? And so Mm -hmm. we have to support people in acknowledging their concerns, giving them access to information, giving them access to the resources that can help them get the answers to the questions that they have. And then we have to work to ensure that they have the information and that the place that they're going to is following good practices, has engaged in uh, ensuring, promoting vaccination in their employees, is practicing regular hygiene, improved their ventilation, uh, all those sorts of things. And, you know, one of the things that businesses are looking to do is how can they portray that? You know, how can they present in a clear way that we're practicing all the safe practices and governments are working with businesses and employers to try to find ways to really reassure people that all those kinds of practices are being followed. Mm -hmm. That'll be incredibly important. I'd like to end on a more hopeful note. What is something you personally are looking forward to and what's something we can all look forward to? Well, today, I've got a reservation on a patio this afternoon <laughs> with my wife and we're going to get out there. It's a sunny day in, here in Toronto. So I'm certainly looking forward to getting back out and engaging in those kinds of activities, uh, visiting with family and, and friends. You know, I'm also looking forward, uh, your listeners know that on July 1st, I start a new job at the University of Waterloo and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into that. You know, to just tie this back, part of why I you know, got interested in taking that is, that, you know, part of the vision there is to create a post-pandemic university that will look at a lot of these issues 
It's the Waterloo region has been a hub of manufacturing in Canada for well over a century. And as we think about how we repatriate some of our manufacturing capacity for critical supplies, they're a, a center for excellence in data science, engineering, artificial intelligence. So a lot of things that we talked about. So I am looking forward to tying a lot of the threads of my career together in that role in creating new education programs, new research programs, and new outreach with society that helps build back a a better Canada. That sounds wonderful. Vivek, thank you so much for your wisdom, your perspective today, and for such a thoughtful conversation. This has been, I would say, the best way to help us wrap up our first season of The Chip. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Check in next time when we bring you more valuable health perspectives and continue to chip away at healthcare topics that matter to you. If you want to learn more about Kaihai, visit our website, kaihai.ca. That's C-I-H-I dot C-A. If you like what you heard, subscribe where you find your podcasts and leave us a review and give us a follow on social media. This episode was produced by Jonathan Kuline with research from Amy Chant, Marissa Duncan, Shraddha Sanke, and Ramon Sayep. I'm Alex Mao. Thanks for tuning in to the Canadian Health Information Podcast. Talk to you next time.